Christ, King of endless glory. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading of the Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. Glory to you, Lord Jesus. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to where there was a garden into which he and his disciples entered. Judas, his betrayer, also knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas got a band of soldiers and guards from the chief priests and the Pharisees and went there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, knowing everything that was going to happen to him, went out and said to them, Whom are you looking for? They answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. He said to them, I am. Judas, his betrayer, was also with them. When he said to them, I am, they turned away and fell to the ground. So he again asked them, Whom are you looking for? They said, Jesus, the Nazarene. Jesus. I told you that I am. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill what he had said. I have not lost any of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his ear, his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its scabbard. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father gave me? So the band of soldiers, the tribune, and the Jewish guards seized Jesus, bound him, and brought him to Annas first. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had counseled the Jews that it was better that one man should die rather than the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Now, the disciple was known to the high priest, and he entered the courtyard of the high priest with Jesus. But Peter stood at the gate outside. So the other disciples, the acquaintance of the high priest, went out and spoke to the gatekeeper and brought Peter in. Then the maid who was the gatekeeper said to Peter, You are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now, the slaves and the guards were standing around the charcoal fire that they had made because it was cold and were warming themselves. Peter was also standing there keeping warm. The high priest questioned Jesus about this, his disciples about his doctrine, and Jesus answered him. I have spoken publicly to the world. I have always taught in a synagogue or in the temple area where all the Jews gathered and in secret I have said nothing. Why, ask me? Ask those who hear, heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the temple guards standing there struck Jesus and said, Is this the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him. If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? 
Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now, Simon Peter was standing there keeping warm, and they said to him, You are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the one whose ear Peter cut off, said, didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and immediately the cock crowed. Then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium. It was morning, and they themselves did not enter the praetorium in order not to be defiled so that they could eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, What, what charges, charges do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. At this, Pilate said to them, Take, Take him, him yourself and judge him according to your law. The Jews answered him, We do not have the right to execute anyone. In order that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled, that he said indicating the kind of death he would die. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own, or have others told you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. So Pilate said to him, Then you are a king. Jesus answered, You say, I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? When he had said this, he again went out to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Not this one, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a, revo a revolutionary. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged. And the soldiers moved the crown of thorns and placed it on his head and clothed him in a purple cloak. And they came to him and said, Hail, King, King of, of the, the Jews. Jews. And they struck him repeatedly. Once more, Pilate went out and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the guards saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered, We have a law. And according to that law, he ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. Now, 
When Pilate heard this statement, he became even more afraid and went back into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus did not, did not answer him. So Pilate said to him, Do you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and I have power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above. For this reason, the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Consequently, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release him, you are not a friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench in the place called Stone Pavement. In Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was preparation day for Passover, and it was about noon. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Take, take him, him away, take, take him, him away, away. Crucify, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We, we have, have no king, king but, but Caesar. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull. In Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus on the middle. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the king of the Jews. Now many of Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. They also took his tunic, but the tunic was seamless woven in one piece from the top down. So they said to one another, Let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it will be. In order that the passage of scripture might be fulfilled that says, They divided my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. This is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciples there, whom he had loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciples, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciples took her into his home. After this, aware that everything was now finished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine, so they put a sponge soaked in wine, 
on a sprig of hyssop and put it up to his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he handed over the spirit. All kneel. Now, since it, was, since it was preparation day, in order that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath day of that week was a solemn one, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and that they be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the leg of the first and then of the other one who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one soldier thrust his lance into his side and immediately blood and water flowed out. An eyewitness has testified and his testimony is true. He knows that he is speaking the truth so that you also may come to believe. For this happened so that scripture passage might be fulfilled. Not a bone of it will be broken. And again, another passage says, they will look upon him whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, secretly a disciple of Jesus for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus. And Pilate permitted it. So he came and took his body. Nicodemus, the one who had first come to him at night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloe, weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and bound it with burial cloths, along with the spices. According to the Jewish burial custom, now in the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been buried. So they laid Jesus there because of the Jewish preparation day, for the tomb was close by. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Please be seated. This moment we are in the middle of the Paschal Tritium. It is three days in which the Lord passes by from this world to the kingdom that belongs to him. Yesterday we were celebrating the commandment of love. Love each other as I have loved you. We were celebrating yesterday also the institution of Holy Eucharist. And also the sharing of that power of God for consecration, the institution of priesthood. Today, for the liturgy of Good Friday, the Holy Friday, we have a specific moments of the liturgy that I would like you to remember and to be aware so that you're able to connect to the mystery that we are celebrating. 
First of all, we just had something that it is called the liturgy of the word. We just heard the passion of the Lord in the Old Testament, the announcements of the sufferings of God, but also the resurrection to come. We will also have with the number of perfection, the number seven, we will have the seven words of Jesus from the cross, words that they are to teach us the way. After that, we will have three more special moments, and they are going to be the solemn intercessions. The church, on Friday, we do intercessions for all the church, for the commanders, and for the people that they have powers to guide this world. Then, connected to the mystery of our redemption, we will have the adoration of the Holy Cross. We will venerate the wood in which the salvation of the world hung. Then we will receive Holy Communion and do the Sermon of Descending from the Cross. So we are in front of a lot of signs that they become reality when we open our hearts and we open the Spirit to be connected to Him. In this moment we will share the seven words of the Lord. Please light the first candle. The first word, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. It makes sense that the first word of Jesus from the cross, it is a word of forgiveness. That's the point of the cross, after all. Jesus is dying so that we might be forgiven for our sins so that we might be reconciled to God for eternity. But the forgiveness of God through Christ doesn't come only to those who don't know what they are doing when they sin. In the mercy of God, we receive His forgiveness even when we do what we know to be wrong. God chooses to wipe away our sins, not because we have some convenient excuse and not because we have tried hard to make up for them, but because he is a God of grace, of amazing grace, with mercies that are new every morning. As we read the words, Father, forgive them. May we understand that we too are forgiven through Christ. As the Apostle John writes in his first letter, if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. Because Christ, Christ died on the cross for us, we are cleansed from all wickedness, from every last sin. We are united with God the Father, as His beloved children, we are free to approach His throne of grace with our needs and concerns. God has removed our sins as far from us as the East is from the West. What great news! Do we really believe God has forgiven our sins? Do we take time on a regular basis to confess our sins so that we might enjoy the freedom of forgiveness? Do we need to experience God's forgiveness in a fresh way today? Let us pray. Gracious Lord, it is easy for me to speak of your forgiveness, even to ask for it and to thank you for it. But do I really believe I'm forgiven? Do I experience the freedom that comes from the assurance that you have cleansed me from my sins? Or do I live as I'm semi-forgiven, even though I have put my faith in you and confess my sins? 
Do I live as sin still has power over me? Do I try to prove myself to you as I might be able to earn more forgiveness? Dear Lord, I believe that you have forgiven me. I believe in this amazing truth. Help me to receive it in my heart. Help me to know with fresh conviction that I'm fully and finally forgiven, not because of anything that I have done, but because of what you have done for me. Light the second candle. The second word, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, it is not just the religious leaders or the soldier that mock Jesus, but even one of the criminals, the downward progressive of mockery. But the criminal on the right speaks up for Jesus, explaining the two criminals are receiving their just due, whereas this man has done nothing wrong. And turning to Jesus, he asked, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What a wonderful faith this repentant sinner has in Jesus. For more than doubting Thomas, one of his own apostles, who betrayed Jesus. Ignoring his own suffering, Jesus responded with love and mercy in his second word. The second word, again, is about forgiveness, this time directed to a sinner, just as the first word. This biblical expression is found only in the Gospel of Luke. Jesus shows his divinity by opening heaven for a repentant sinner. Such generosity to a man that only asks to be remembered. This expression offers us hope for salvation. For if we turn our heart and prayer to him, we will also be with Jesus at the end of our lives. Let, Let us, us pray. pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I wonder at your grace and mercy. When we cried out to you, you hear us. When we ask you to remember us, when you come into your kingdom, you offer the promise of paradise. Your mercy, dear Lord, exceeds anything we might imagine. It embraces us. It encourages us. It heals us. Oh Lord, today I trust in you, my life. But now and in the world to come, put it in your hands. So I pray, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, remember me today as I seek to live within your kingdom. Amen. Light the third candle. The third word. Mother, here is your son. And to the disciple he loved, here is your mother. As Jesus was dying, his mother was among those who had remained with him. Most of the disciples had fled, with the exception of one, whom the gospel calls the disciple he loved. We can be exactly sure of his identity, but many we believe that it is John, who is also the one behind the writing of the gospel. No matter who the beloved disciple was, it is clear that Jesus was forging a relationship between the disciple and his mother, one in which the disciple would take care of Mary. 
Jesus wanted to make sure she would be in good hands after his death. The presence of Mary at the cross adds both humanity and horror to the scene. We are reminded that Jesus was a real human being, true man who had once been a boy, who had once been carried in the womb of his mother. Even as he was dying on the cross as the savior of the world, Jesus was also a son, a role he didn't neglect in his last moments. When we think of the crucifixion of Jesus from the perspective of Mary, the horror increases. The death of a child is one of the most painful and parental experiences. To watch one's beloved child experience the extreme torture of crucifixion must have been unimaginably terrible. We are reminded of the prophecy of Simeon shortly after Jesus' birth when he said to Mary, and a sword will pierce your very soul. This sin helps us not to glorify the crucifixion. He was a real man, true flesh and blood, a son of a mother, dying with unbearable agony. His sufferings was altogether real, and he took it on for you and for me. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, the presence of your most blessed mother at the cross engages our heart. You are no longer only the Savior dying for the sins of the world. You are also fully human man, a son with a mother. Lord, how can I begin to thank you for what you suffered? My words fall short. My thoughts seem superficial. Nevertheless, I offer my sincere gratitude for your suffering. Thanks for bearing my sin on the cross. I give you my praise, my love, my heart, all that I am, because you have given me all that you are. All praise be to you, Lord Jesus, fully God and fully human, Savior of the world. Amen. The fault word, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This was the only expression of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew and Mark. Both Gospels relate that was in the ninth hour, after three hours of darkness, that Jesus cried out this fault word. The ninth hour was three o'clock in Judea. After the fourth word, Mark related with a horrible sense of finality, and Jesus uttered a light cry and breathed his last. One is struck by the anguished tone of his expression in contrast to the first three words of Jesus. This cry is from the painful heart of the human Jesus who must feel deserted by his Father and the Holy Spirit. No mention also the earthly companion that he had, the apostle. Everybody had abandoned him. As if, that, as if to emphasize his loneliness, Mark even has his loved one looking far from far. Not close to him, as in the Gospel of John, Jesus feels separated from his Father. He is now all alone and he must face death by himself. But is not this exactly what happened to all of us when we die? Is that the same? Sometimes when we feel in bed dying, we feel all alone. We feel that loneliness when we are ill. We feel lonely sometimes when we need someone around us. Even when we invoke God, sometimes we still feel lonely. 
But God had faith. Jesus had faith on his father. But it's not this exactly what happened. We are two all alone at time of death. Jesus completely lives the human experience as we do. And by doing so, free us from the clutches of sin. His fourth word is the opening line of the Psalm 22. And this cries from the cross. Recall the cry of Israel and all innocent persons who suffer. These, they have pierced my hand and my feet. They have numbered all my bones. The psalm continue. They divide my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lot. There cannot be more dreadful moments in the history of a man as this moment. Jesus, who came to save us, is crucified. And he realized the horror of what is happening and what he now is enduring for you and I. He is about to be engulfed in the raging sea of sin. Evil triumphs, as Jesus admits, but this is, is your hour. But it's only for a moment. The burden of all the sins of humanity for a moment overwhelmed the humanity of our Savior. But does this not have to happen, does it? Did he really have to do this, what he did for you and I? Did he? What more love can he have done for us, isn't it? What love can he have done for us? Let us pray. <clears throat> for Lord Jesus, thou I will never fully grasp the wonder and horror of your abandonment by the Father. Every time that I read these words, I'm overwhelmed with gratitude. How can we ever thank you for what you suffered for us? What can we do but to offer ourselves to you in gratitude and praise? Thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you suffered. Thank you for taking my place. Thank you for being forsaken by the Father so that I might never be. Amen. The fifth word, Jesus said, I'm thirsty. No doubt, Jesus experienced extreme thirst while being crucified. He would have had lost a substantial quantity of fluids, blood, and sweat through what we had endured even prior to crucifixion. Thus, his statement, I'm thirsty, was on the most obvious level a request for something to drink. In response, the soldiers gave to Jesus sour wine, a cheap beverage common among lower class in that time. The Apostle John notes that Jesus said, I am thirsty, not only as a statement of physical reality, but also in order to fulfill the scripture in reference to the Psalm 69. Their insults have broken my heart and I am in despair. If only one person would show pity, if only one turned and comfort me, but instead they give me poison for food. They offer to me sour wine for my thirst. As he suffered, Jesus embodied the pain of the people that which had been captured in the Psalms. Jesus was suffering for the sins of the entire world, even as he was taking upon himself the entire sins of the world. As I reflect on Jesus' statement, I'm thirsty. I keep thinking of my own thirst. It's nothing like that of Jesus. Rather, we all thirst for him. Our soul calls for the living water that only Jesus 
can supply. We rejoice in the fact that he suffered thirst on the cross and so much more so that my thirst, your thirst for the water of life might be quenched. How do we respond to the statement of the Lord? I am thirsty. What does this statement suggest to us? What it suggests about yourself? Let us pray. O oh Lord, once again, we thank you for what you have suffered on the cross. Besides extraordinary pain, you also experience extreme thirst. All of this was part and parcel of your taking on our humanity so that you might take away our sins. The sixth word, Jesus said, it is finished. When Jesus said, it is finished, surely he was expressing relief that his suffering was over. It is finished meant, in part, this is finally done. But the Greek verb translated, it is finished, means more than just this. It captures the full scene of the message. It's done. It's complete. Jesus had accomplished his mission. He had announced and inaugurated the kingdom of God. He had revealed with his word, it is all finished, the love and extreme grace of God. He had embodied that love and grace by dying for the sins of the world, for your sins, for my sins, opening up the way for all to live under the reign of God. Because Jesus finished his work of salvation, you and I, we don't need to add to it. In fact, we can't. It is accomplished what we never could taking our sins upon himself and giving us his life in return. Jesus finished that for which he had been sent and we are the beneficiaries of his unique effort because of what he finished, you and I, you and I are never finished. We have hope for this life and for the next. We know that nothing can set us apart from God's love. And one day, what God has begun in us will also be finished by his grace. Until that day, we'll live in the confidence of Jesus. Cry of victory, it is finished. Let us pray. How can we ever find words to express more gratitude to you, Lord Jesus? You did it. You finished that for which you had been sent, faithful in life, faithful in death. You accomplished that which no other person could do, taking the sins of the world away upon your sinless shoulders taking my sins so that I might receive your forgiveness and new life. All praise be to you, gracious Lord, for finishing the work of salvation. All praise be to you, dear Jesus, for saving us. Amen. The seven word, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. The seven word of Jesus is from the Gospel of Luke, 
and is directed to the Father in heaven. Just before he dies, Jesus recalls Psalm 31, Into thy hand I commend my spirit. Thou haste, redeem me, O Lord, faithful God. Jesus was obedient to his Father to the end. He never gave up, never turned away, and never asked for anything to relieve his pain. And at the final word on his death at the cross, it was a prayer to his Father. The relationship of Jesus to the Father is revealed in the Gospel of John. For he remarked, the Father and I are one. And again at the Last Supper, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The word that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own. The Father who dwells in me is doing his work and he can return. I come from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I am leaving the world and going to the Father. Jesus fulfilled his own mission and to at his Father on the cross. Redeem me, O Lord, the God of truth. Notice the word voice, the loud voice that the Lord almost screamed. Hmm? Father, into your hand I commend my spirit. Almost saying, where are you? I'm giving everything for you. And here I am, into your hand as my last breath. But Jesus seemed determined that this final words be heard. His words are firm and confident. He knew that something good going to happen. The words spoken by Jesus on the cross after his invocation, Father, borrow sentence from the Psalm 31, into your hand I commend my spirit. Yet these words are not a mere citation, but rather express a firm decision. He could not walk away. He endured to the end. Jesus delivered himself to the Father in an act of total abandonment. These words are a prayer of entrustment, total trust in God's love. How many times we feel that moment of trust? But with three, we can examine three aspects of the seven words. Word of intimacy. Jesus, first, what he says, he speaks to God as his father. Jesus speaks to God with intimacy. His time of desolation expressed by the fourth word, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's past. He prays to the father. He has done throughout his ministry. He was faithful for the three, for the three years of his life to do God's word. Every time Jesus did something, he invoked the Father. Always look up, Father, can I do this? Father, can I do that? With your permission, can I allow to do that? He had his conscience. Jesus' conscience was God the Father. He could do nothing without the Father. But yet, on the end, he felt almost abandoned. I said, where are you? I worked for you three years. And right now, you let me go this way? He just could not conceive because he was human. He did not use his divinity. As a human person, he felt that pain tremendously. But he stayed committed. A, third, a second word is of trust. He trusted. Jesus entrusted himself to the Father. He knew. But anyway, even trusting, he was still a human. His pain speak up for him. He was in tremendous agonizing pain. If you see the movie, Will Gibson, The Passion of Christ, St. John Paul II saw the movie and they asked about his opinion. He said, it's exactly how it was. If you saw the movie, you know how much God died for us. The pain, the agony. Do we deserve this, do we? Do we understand the love of God for us, do we? Do we know how much this man, this man can love you and me? The pain that he go through. It is no greater love to lay down your life for a friend, isn't it? 
The third is a surrender. Finally, he said, that's it, I give up. I'm done. Whatever you do with me is fine. And what happened? And we know what happened. He resurrected on the third day, right? But on that moment, on that moment of his humanity, his spirit, his spirit breathed on him. His spirit, it was not yet kind of a developed yet because he could not use his spirit. He cannot use his divinity. He died at the cross as a human being like you and I. Suffered the pain of the thorn of the crown, four lash on his back, nails on his hand and feet, hung at the cross. You just imagine, just put yourself on his shoes. I beg you. You can close your eyes and put yourself on the cross. Hmm? If a nail hurts you or scratch you, you say, oh my God, it's hurting. Let me put a Band-Aid. Can you handle pain, physical pain? I think none of us can handle. But he did it. He did it for you and I. What greater love this can be, huh? What more love we want from a loving, caring God. He's giving himself for us completely, unconditionally. He was intimate with the Father with trust and surrender. Jesus prayed his final prayer with self-control and peace because he knows the Father and knows that there is life with the Father beyond death. He knew that. But he had to go to the human condition. Amazing. When you know something good is expected for your only end. But to get to this good, you have to go into pain and agony. But you know, on the end of this pain and agony, you're going to get something good, isn't it? But Jesus had no choice. He had no choice but to go to the pain and agony. And he knew that the Father will take care of him. What the Father sent him into the world to do has now been accomplished. Christ offered himself without blemish to God and put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Let us pray. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As, as it, it was, was in the beginning, beginning it's now, now and, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.